Well, hey, welcome everyone. So good to have everyone here this morning. You all look really good. Yeah, like you should like me like, yeah, I knew I did. I put on these clothes for a reason. Well, so good to see you. Those of you who are online, you all look good too. You're probably wearing your 90s, right? Well, so good to have everyone join in with us. Uh, way to go, man. You made it here. And we're going to have a great time worshiping and uh, celebrating God and, and just giving him honor and praise and, uh, and just a great time in worship. Hey, so if you're online, we want to encourage you to get your communion items, your juice and your uh, biscuit. Uh, we're going to do that during our worship experience. And, um, and we're going to just hear a great message this morning. So, uh, hey, we're all going to come together and worship God. Hey, join me as we pray. So, Heavenly Father, we just ask that you just come. Come and just, uh, just embrace us, Lord. Just come and be with us as we worship here this morning. As we come to celebrate you, give honor to you for who you are. Thank you for all that you've done this week, God. You are truly worthy of the praise. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's worship God together. morning. We are so glad that you're here with us today, whether you're in the seats or at home. We are going to worship God this morning because he's so worthy of our praise. If you'll stand with us. Yes, Lord, we thank you for worship. We lift up our voices, Lord. We pray that they would be pleasing to your ears. tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what we don't deserve it yes you take the broken things, raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you won, I am. I am who you say. Heaven 
teaching me how to receive it. So let all the striving cease, yes. faithful yes you have and all my life you have 
been so, so good yes. With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice I love your voice have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God let's sing all my life so good Lord now's the time in our service where we're going to partake in communion so if you have it go ahead and get it ready there are more at the back if you don't and um, I'd like to pray over communion father we are so grateful how amazing is it that we get to come to you and worship father that you just bless us and the most amazing blessing is the sacrifice of your son father his body was broken and his blood was poured out just so that we, no strings attached, Lord, other than believing in your sacrifice and that you love us and you want a relationship with us, Lord, that we get to have one with you. We're so grateful. As we take communion, please just search our hearts. Find any unclean thing, anything keeping us from you, Lord. Point it out to us. Help us to walk it out. love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise yes, we could Lord. ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Yes, Lord oh. Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and watch show me show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me amen let's give him some praise All right, guys, we're going to end this on a high energy note today. So if you'll praise with us, are you redeemed? If you are redeemed today, let me hear you say, yes, Lord, I am redeemed. And we're going to sing that together today. We are redeemed by the Lord. What does it mean to be saved? Isn't it more than just a prayer to pray? More than just a way to heaven. What does it mean? to be his, to be formed in his likeness, know that we have a purpose, and here's our purpose, to be salt and light in the world, in the world, to be salt and light in the world, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, yes, let the redeemed of the Lord say Lord. Thank you for worshiping with us. Please say hello to your neighbors. Maybe do an elbow or a wave. We're so glad you're with us here today. We love you.
Good morning, I'm Marie Carter, and I'm one of the volunteers here, and let's continue our worship through giving. Um, but first, if this is your first time here, I want to say welcome. We're so glad you're with us. If you're here in person, we'd love to get to know you better. So there's a card um, in the lobby that you can fill out, and we will... Um, someone will contact you. If you're joining us online, thank you again. You can check us out on our website at sensicompass.com and click on the I'm new here button and um, follow the prompts and someone will get back in touch with you. So I've got a few announcements before giving. Announcement number one, 40 day fast. Here at Compass, we like to take the first 40 days of the new year and devote those to fasting and prayer and to seeking God for our lives and for directions. So um, if you want more information about that, there's some packets in the lobby you can pick up or you can go on the website, um, our website, and click on the fasting experience button and you can follow along each day and um, you can choose something that you're gonna give up. Um, personally, I'm giving up late night snacking. That's something that's a stronghold for me, so I'll be giving that up. Um, announcement number two is First Steps. We have a class called First Steps. It starts next Sunday. Um, you can join Dorian and some of the leaders here um, to get more information about what we're all about. And if you have questions and those kind of things, that's a definitely a great place to um, to uh, to get those, to find out about us. So you can go online too and to reserve um, your spot there. Um, number three, starting point. We've got a class starting on January 21st on Thursday at 7 p.m. Starting Point is a great place to um, learn more about the faith. If you've got questions or two, if you want to grow in your faith or if you're a believer and you want to just, you have some questions about God, um, it's a great place to come. It's an in-person eight-week class and um, you can go ahead and sign up for that too online. Number four, life groups. Life groups will be starting in February, so um, there'll be more, more information to come as, um, as it gets closer, and life groups is definitely a way to get a chance to meet more people and to grow in your faith as well. And last but not least, I wanna remind you about our Monday night prayer experiences. It's from seven to 8 p.m., and it's a great time to come to just, um, to just take a moment to slow down, to um, pray, to meditate, to journal, to just rest, whatever you'd like to do. It's a great place to come and just to be still and to, um, to just relax in His presence. So let's continue our worship through giving. Here at Compass, we believe in giving not only of our time and our talents to the Lord, we also believe in giving our funds. So there are four main ways that you can give here at Compass. Number one, you can drop off your, um, your gift, uh, your monetary gift at the church um, at door number one. On the outside there, there's a box, a black box. You can drop it in there. Um, the second way of giving is to go on our website, sensicompass.com and click on the Give button and um, follow the prompts there. Um, the third way to give is through your bank. Um, your bank can draft a check um, and mail it to the church at no cost to you or no cost to the church. Um, that's the way that I give. And the fourth way to give is you can actually mail your offering into the building, to the physical um, building. Um, the address is there on the screen. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll um, um, go ahead and hear our message. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity today to give, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, that you were the first example of giving to us. You gave us, that you loved us so much, you gave us your son, and he paid the price for us, Lord, that we may have eternal life with you and also abundant life on this earth. So we ask, Lord, that you bless the offering for those who are giving today and those who are giving in the future, and also bless those, Lord, who have a desire to give but not are able to give at this moment. Thank you so much for all your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that you will multiply it and that it will be used for your kingdom and it will bring many souls to you, Father. We also ask, Lord, that you bless us as we listen to the message that's coming soon, Father, and that our hearts be open and that we receive all you have for us and that we apply what we hear and what we learn, Lord, to our lives for your for growth. Thank you, Lord, so much for your, again for your blessings. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As you know, faith is not a destination. Faith is a journey. And some of you are pretty far along on that journey. But others of you may have a lot of questions. You may be at the very beginning of your faith journey. And the church 
Well, the church is the last place you think to speak up or ask your questions or voice your doubts. So let's change that. Starting point is where questions about God turn into conversations about faith, about your faith. It's a place where you can actually voice your doubts and explore some of the trickiest topics of faith, free from pressure and free from judgment. You see, we'd rather talk with you than at you. And starting point is where that happens. So if you're ready, let's talk. I'm so excited about Starting Point. It is starting January 21st on a Thursday night, and we're going to do eight weeks of it, and it's from 7 to 8.30, and it's just going to be a great experience. And no matter where you're at in your journey or your uh, understanding of Christianity, uh, we want you to come, and we want you to invite your friends and people you work with and your family and that. This is just such a, an important piece of who we are uh, in our journey in life. And so uh, all you got to do is go to www.cincycompass.com and uh, click on the starting point box, click on that, and you can get yourself registered. There's no cost. And let's journey together and figure out, really, what our faith is all about. Are you with me? All right, I'll see you soon. Colossians chapter three, living the new life. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual morality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature, and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and He lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Right. That's a text that we're going to be using during this uh, message today. So we are in a new series. This is the beginning of the year. And this is the first series that we're going to be leading into the year with. And it's called CrossFit, uh, getting into spiritual shape. 
And so I'm not going to ask you to lift weights today. I'm not going to ask you to do jumping jacks or sit-ups, um, you know, bench presses and all those different kind of things. You know, uh, they've got this new one called, well, it's probably not new, new to me, you know, burpees. You know, burp. Who, who does burpees? Why would people even do that stuff, you know? Why can't you just burp, you know? And, but they've got this new thing called burpees. And I did that with my wife the other day, and that thing half killed me. Looked like I just came out the shower. Oh, my word. Well, we're going to be talking about getting into spiritual shape. I'm not going to ask you to work out, all right, physically, but spiritual shape. Like, what kind of work do we need to be putting in place to make sure that we're spiritually strong? And I know some of you have probably accepted Jesus Christ into your hearts years ago, years upon years ago, probably been going to church for a long time. Some of you may be new babes in Christ. Uh, but wherever you are on the spectrum of a relationship with Jesus Christ, we all need to continuously be working on getting into spiritual shape. Now, here's the deal. Getting into spiritual shape, like doing a spiritual workout, it is not easy. But the more we do it, the better we become. The more we do it, the better we become. There was this bike class that Janice took me to. You know, uh, they, they got this new cycling thing now that they do too. You know, you just can't ride a bike and enjoy it. And, uh, and so she took me to this cycling class. She said, you got to come to this class, door. You got to come to this class. I'm like, okay, Janice, I'll go to this class. So I went to this class, and uh, I wanted to sit sort of in the back, but there were no seats in the back, so I had to sort of sit like up in the front, in the middle, and where people could like see me. And uh, so the instructor starts. And this is like on one of these cycling bikes that, you know, well, they always are asking you to get up. I don't know why they ask you to do that. Why can't you just sit down and ride? And so she's asking you to get up and sit down. And, and this is a bike that goes to the left. And then it leans to the right. And she's got us doing all this kind of stuff. And I am struggling. I'm having the hardest time doing all these different kind of things that she's wanting me to do. And I mean, I will say that I totally failed. Totally fell. It was like a 50-minute class, and I totally fell. Sat on my booty majority of the class and just sort of struggled through that class. Well, here's the deal. I kept going. Sunday after Sunday, I kept going. And do you know, every Sunday I got better and better and better to where I was able to really push through the entire class, 50 minutes, getting up, getting down, going to the side and to the other side and really pushing through and becoming and looking like a professed person in uh, doing this whole bike class thing, you know? The more we do it, the better we become. The more we do it, the better we become. This whole idea of getting spiritually in shape has to do with us leaning into the presence of God and doing the God stuff so that we see the benefits of it playing out in our lives. So preparing for the race. Preparing for the race of life takes lots and lots of work. Uh, it's like training, uh, running, uh, eating right, and, and more running, and, and you know, disciplining ourselves to get enough rest, and drinking lots of water, oh my word, and going to the bathroom a lot, and then more running, and lots of training to really get us to that place. The better you train, the better chances you are at running the race, but not only running the race, the better chances you are at winning, all right? In the race of living life here on earth, Jesus is uh, training us. He's wanting us to train for some very important things, things that is going to make us better as we live our lives uh, in this world. The more training we put in place, the more effective we're going to be in living out the Christ-like life here in this work, in this world. And guess what, guys? God has some awesome and amazing things in store for us. The more that we train, the more we'll be able to see those kinds of things that God has in store for our lives. I love being able to look at my mom and pops, you know, two folks who have walked with God for a very long time. And these individuals have the ability to really, you know, understand and see and live in the blessings that God has laid out for them all of the work that they put in place in raising their kids, all of the work that they put in place in working in ministry and teaching us how to serve in ministry and be a part of the kingdom of God. They have the ability to now see the blessings, the fruit of all of the work that they've done. And no, my parents are not millionaires. Boy, I wish they were, <laughs> but they're not millionaires. It's not about the material. It's not about the money, but it's about the joy. It's about peace. 
It's about, man, being able to wake up in the morning and being able to, you know, know that they have a true north, that God is the center of their attention, and they live for God. Now, here's the deal. Man, their life and where they are today has taken so much time, so much work. In other words, so much time being in the gym and working out those spiritual muscles to be where they are today. Oh, man, I remember as a kid growing up, Dad would wake us up in the morning, and uh, we would, uh, he would take us out uh, to the living room, and we would have these couches, all these couches in the living room, and all of us would have a couch, and we would all get on our knees, and we would all pray, and it would be morning devotion. And Dad would just be there just praying, man, just calling out to God, and it was so cool to remember the beginning of that whole experience, because, of course, by the end, I was out. I was knocked out, you know, on the couch on my knees. But man, I'll never forget those moments of dad waking us up and having those moments with us as, as kids. Now, that is all about, you know, working your, your spiritual muscles, you know. Well, today I want to talk about this idea of living discipline to creating a plan. That if we're going to work our spiritual muscles, we have to create a plan for this, 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 this life that we're going to live. Some of you are doing the 40-day fast that um, we're, we've taken on here as a church. And so some of you are actually going to be living out exactly what I'm talking about this morning. You're going to be living out uh, some of the things that uh, I'm going to be laying out and some of the challenges and experiences that we all will go through in our lives when we talk about this idea of uh, working our spiritual muscles. So, okay, in the text today, Paul is basically laying out a path for life or a path for living. All right, in this Colossians text. Uh, here's what Paul says. Paul says, if then you have been raised with Christ. So he's identifying a group of people who have made a decision to walk with God. All right, you're not sort of, you know, walking the line here. You've made a decision. You've said, Jesus Christ, you're the one. You're the one I'm going to follow. So he's basically saying, so if you have made that decision for Jesus Christ to be the one, there is no question in regards to how we're supposed to be living. And how we're supposed to be carrying ourselves. And I know life will lay out and put forth some major challenging things. Some tough stuff that will make us want to waver or make us want to give in in regards to what comes out of us. But Paul reminds us. This is why I love the Bible, the Word of God. Don't forget this is what we live by. Paul reminds us anytime you feel like something is questionable or you're wondering, how should I live? What should I do? Paul reminds us. If you are a Christ follower, here's what you ought to be able to do. Here's what you should be doing. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Very defining point. Very defining point. So he's laying it out and he's saying, man, hey, if you're going to if you're going to live on this earth, set your set your focus on God, not on the earth, because the earth is going to throw a whole lot of stuff at you. It's going to try to persuade you and influence you to go whole kinds of different ways. So focus on God. Clothe yourselves with these kinds of things. So, again, I love it when we can when Paul lays this kind of stuff out because he lays out the practical. He says he doesn't like lay out this, you know, big, wide thing that we can't grasp or that we can't get and reach. Paul says, I'm going to lay out some stuff for you that you can really get, you can understand, and you can play out in your life. It's the practical. So you have the ability to even measure these kinds of things in your life. How long have you done it? Hey, in 2020, you know, were you tenderhearted? Hey, in 2020, were you, did you express mercy? Did you express kindness? You can measure these kinds of things. Just ask your husband or wife that you're sitting next to right now. How merciful were you in 2020? How kind were you in, in 2020? These are practical things that we can measure. We can also measure where we screwed up and didn't do it right. Clothe yourselves with tenderheartedness, mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Ooh, that's one that we all can measure. Verse 13, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Ooh, we could measure that one, couldn't we? Because we know that people will offend us. He also continues on, close yourselves with love and let the peace that comes from Christ Rule in your hearts and be thankful all the time. Let peace roam in your hearts and be thankful all the time. 
Paul, Paul says, hey, there are some things that you shouldn't do. And he does lay that out in that text. You, you heard it read. But he also says, no, I'm not going to just leave you with the things that you shouldn't, but I'm also going to give you a list of things that you should be practicing within your life. A plan. What I do. It begins with your values. Like, what are the values that you have in your life? Your values begin with your beliefs. Oh, well, what do you believe in? Well, your beliefs begin with who you believe in. So now we have the ability to sort of backtrack and say, well, this is who I believe in. This, who I believe in defines my beliefs, and uh, my beliefs define my values, and my values help me to work out the plan that I'm going to live with in my life. So once we have established who we believe in, then we can get back to the plan. What plan are you living out in your life? I mean, you're a believer of Jesus Christ. Paul lays it out for the church here and those folks there in that church, but also as a word of his example and encouragement for those of us who live in the church today. So how am I going to live out this disciplined life that Jesus wants me to live out? The word discipline in the Greek stands for to wear down, to beat, to have self-control, to instruct, to train, or to teach. Discipline is all about order. Whether that order is, you know, self-inflicted, that I'm going to get myself in order, or whether that order is order given by a parent to a child. You know, a parent being able to say, son, you know, I've got to instruct you, I've got to discipline you in the right path in the right way. And, and boy, how many of you were disciplined by your parents to get into the right way? Any hands? You know, don't worry. You don't have to be ashamed. Robert, yeah, my mama disciplined me a lot. And, and not on, you know, I, you know, Robert, we were raised back in the day, right? Back in the day, which, of course, meant that mama, mama whooped you. But not only was mama the one who had the ability to give that little spanking, but so did uh, the neighbor <laughs> and also your grandparents and also your aunts. You know, in today's time now, you know, aunts and uncles can get in trouble for whooping their nieces and nephews with the parent, right? <laughs> Even the school teacher disciplined you. Oh, my word. School teachers get sued now, <laughs> you know. Discipline. It is important. The Proverbs talk about the lack of discipline and what the lack of discipline does. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 23, it says, They die for a lack of discipline, and because of their great folly, they are lost. Any of you ever experienced kids who have had a lack of discipline in their lives? Like, you didn't tell their parents, but, I mean, you, you basically were sitting on the sideline just watching it all play out. I mean, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Sitting in, uh, in, in Macy's or going through Dillard's, and you're seeing that child locked up, and you're sitting there saying, ooh, I just wish I could just, I just wish I could just get to him. That mama just needs to get that child in order. And then that child that had all of that disorder, all of that lack of discipline, grows up to be an adult, and then we begin to see an adult still acting like a child, all because of what the proverb says here, a lack of instruction, a lack of guidance. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, don't you realize that in a race, uh, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. Paul is speaking from a worldly perspective. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training, instructed. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it. Now he's going to show the difference between worldly running, worldly winning, worldly prize from the perspective of godly winning, godly prize. He says, but we do. He says that all of them do it for a, a prize that, you know, is here on earth. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize, verse 26, so I run purpose with purpose in every step, every step, not like every few steps. Paul is basically saying every step that I make, I'm going to run with person, purpose. It's going to be a defined kind of step, and I can't misstep. I can't, I can't like, you know, drop the ball and I'm going to rest today and pick it up tomorrow. No, Paul is saying, man, every step that I take is going to be a defined step with purpose. I am not just shadow boxing. All right, he says I, in verse 27, I discipline my body like an athlete running, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul is taking this like majorly seriously. 
He's basically saying, man, I got to train, I got to instruct, I got to have self-control, I've got to really create for myself the kind of body and the kind of life that I need to be living for Jesus Christ if I'm going to win for that eternal prize. And don't forget, it is, it's a prize that does not disappear or go away, you know. But here's the deal. How do we live out a disciplined life here on earth today? Well, we create a plan. There's no way around it. You know, some individuals decide, can decide to, you know, and some of our personalities are just like this, you know, where some of us are just loosey-goosey, you know, uh, you know we're, we're sort of like, hey, just bring it as it comes. Uh, you know, I mean, some of us are just like that, and this is some of our personalities are very structured and very organized and very put together. I personally believe that the Holy Spirit works with all people, and he'll work with individuals who have personalities that lean on either side. But here's the deal. You cannot get around the idea of living a disciplined life. You can't. You can't live a life that's loosey-goosey with no structure and no guidance. Yeah, and the Holy Spirit will still work with you as you live that very disciplined life. You know, don't forget God is a God of order and decency. And so we have to create a plan. And here's the deal. Starting with anything, anything that we start with is tough. So if some of you are saying, yeah, Dorian, man, I, I got to get this going. I got to start waking up. I got to start praying. I got to start reading my word. I really got to start, you know, pushing some of these things that I'm doing my, in my life off. And I really need to start putting some things that I need, that I haven't been doing. I need to start putting them on because I need to start being more disciplined, Dorian, you know. So some of us are doing the 40-day fast. Wonderful example of what I'm talking about here. And many of you are fasting uh, and uh, things that, you, that have attached themselves to you. You know, now, you know, mo in most churches, you know, they usually call off the list, you know. And usually on the list, they have, you know, all of the, the, the bad stuff, you know, uh, drinking and smoking and, 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 and some of those, you know, really bad ones, you know. Here's the reality. Um, we all are broken and messed the dickens up. We all are. You know, and, and so someone who might be struggling with something that a large group of people might say, oh, that's just horribly bad. Um, you, know, you know, another person may be struggling with something that is doing major destruction to a whole lot of people, like not being able to, to control their anger or their temper um, or, or, or being tempted to, you know, to, to have sticky hands or to maneuver things around so that others don't see, you know. They call them uh, white-collared crimes versus blue-collared crimes, you know. Uh, the reality is, is that we all are broken, and, and what we're talking about is each person going within themselves and saying, man, God, what is it that you want to change in me? Uh, what is it that has attached itself to me that you want out? that you don't want to be a part of the way I live my life. In fact, God, I know that you want to do great things in me, but God, there are some things that I got in me that I'm doing, that I'm being, that I don't need to do and be. God, help me identify what those things are and help me get rid of them. So we're saying that we're taking our bodies and we're wanting to turn our bodies around. We're wanting to change the rhythm. We're wanting to change the plan and Changing rhythm, plan, the way we've been doing things for so long. Oh my goodness, it's hard. And that's where the battle begins, doesn't it? So, so in 1 Corinthians, you know, 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, what Paul is saying here about this race is major. Paul is saying, man, you've got to get your, your skin, your flesh under subjection. Like you've got to really, you know, discipline, beat, instruct, train your flesh as to how it is going to live and how it's supposed to live. If you're going to really win this thing, you have to be the leader of your flesh. You have to guide your flesh. You have to tell your flesh, no, this is what we're going to do. Because we know that our flesh is going to yearn, desire things that may not necessarily be good for it. I mean, how many of you have stayed up late in the night, like after 9 o'clock, and you've sat there and you've said to yourself, I just feel like I need to eat something. And you, 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 you'll go and get something to eat, right? The problem with that is, is that then the next night you, you stay up until 9, 10 o'clock later, and again, it happens again. Your flesh starts telling you, I think I really need to eat something again. And you, and you go and you, you get something to eat. And for some of you, we can hone in on specifically what some of those things are, right? Some, some of you go ahead and throw a popcorn in the microwave. Or some of you uh, 
you know, go and, uh, you know, maybe you have a, a piece of pie or a cake or a thing like that that you like to eat. Or, you know, for me, Doritos, you know, you know, go get Doritos, you know. And, uh, and, and again, the list goes long and it goes wide. You know, some of us can find ourselves saying, well, I'll just, you know, cut the night off with a little small drink of something, you know, and that, that makes me feel good to go to bed with. You know, again, I don't think that any of these things are horrible and destructive and, you know, you're going to hell for them. What I am saying, though, is that if we find ourselves creating a pattern of doing these kinds of things and living this kind of way, now our flesh is controlling us. And if God was to say, hey, on the 10th night that you did this thing, hey, I want you to actually not do it and I want you to go spend some time with me. Or I want you to go to bed early. The problem is, is that now there becomes the battle. God, you want me to do what? God, this is my night where I go and get my popcorn. God, you know the norm. We we usually throw a cookie in the microwave, throw some ice cream on it, God, and that's the norm of what we do. So the problem is, is that our flesh creates these norms, these patterns. Again, I'm just talking from the perspective of us going to bed. There are other patterns that we find ourselves living out throughout the day in our lives. Some of us, every Friday, we have to go and do a certain kind of thing, you know. And so we create these rhythms as to how we live our lives. And again, the question that we have to ask ourselves, are we creating a, a rhythm, a plan, the way our lives are moving and, 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 and in such a way to whereas in the long haul, the Holy Spirit doesn't have the ability to control, lead, and guide our lives Understanding the Bible commentary says this, in this imagery context, Paul writes in, from 1 Corinthians 9, he writes of runners, he recognizes that runners race for a prize, that is, they run for a purpose, yet despite the intensity and effort of all the runners, only one wins the prize. Using this picture, Paul admonishes the Corinthians to an active and disciplined life. This is not a simple motivational speech to, speech to encourage people to a happier existence. Paul calls to purposefulness itself uh, uh, has a purpose. Paul's call to, a, to, a, to purpose, purposefulness itself has a purpose. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Here's what the NIV says. It says, no, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself may not be disqualified for the prize. NRSV says, but I punish my body and enslave it so that after proclaiming to others, I myself should not be disqualified. Why is the body so hard to train and discipline? Oh, my word. What's the deal here? Well, I think it's really all centered around this idea of the mind, my mind and my flesh. It would be great if the body just sort of like had its, you know, like, hey, it had actually a mind to actually, um, you know, lead it and guide it. I mean, our flesh doesn't have a brain to it. Our body has a brain. And this brain that's within our body, this is where the challenge begins, doesn't it? Paul actually talks about this battle that goes on between the mind and the flesh, and he talks about sin. Here's what he says in uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25. So I find this law at work. And there's so much more before this scripture, guys, that I'm reading here. I would encourage you, write Romans 7 down, read the entire chapter. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Boy, if this doesn't sound like some of us this week, right? For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. In other words, I want to do it. Like, I, I've understood what the 40-day fast is. I've understood what God is calling me to do. I understand the kind of things that have attached itself to me. Things that I love. Eee, I love these things. And I've created a rhythm for these things. But I also understand God's law and I delight in it. But I see another law at work in me. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of law of sin at work within me. Ooh. Verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Living out a God's plan is tough. It's tough. 
But I really do believe what Paul lays out here is he says, yeah, but it's doable. It is tough, but it is also doable. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't know what Paul's struggle is. We don't know what his thorn in his flesh was. Thank God he didn't identify it, you know, because we would think like that's, okay, good. I have a thorn just like, like, like Paul. Okay, good. I'm good. I got God's grace, you know. Paul never identifies what his struggle was or what his thorn was. But he, but he understands the grace that comes through Jesus Christ by living for Jesus Christ. Here's the deal. Rhythm was created by God. He wants us to win. He, he provides for us a way as to how we're supposed to win. Order, structure, design, focus, clarity. All of these things are things that God created. And if we are able to fall in line and live with that kind of order and structure and training, man, our lives are going to be great. We're going to do well. But if we continue to live loosey-goosey with no order and no structure, we, we won't be able to see the benefits and the blessings that God has in store for us. God's desire for us to, is to live with a plan. But he desires for us to live with his plan. And he desires for us to live with his rhythm, not our own. Everything out there might look good, but not everything out there is good for us. The question is, God, what is the rhythm that you want for my life? And we've got to keep in mind, our rhythms are all different. You know, God does it different for each and every one of us. So the question is, God, how do you want me to live? There's a group of scriptures, actually an entire chapter here in Deuteronomy chapter 8, where in Deuteronomy, we have these words that are written to the children of Israel who were in bondage and now, you know, in experiencing freedom. Here's what it says. This entire commandment that I command you today, you must diligently observe so that you may live and increase and go in and occupy the land that the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember, the long way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The clothes on your back did not wear out and your feet did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a parent disciplines a child, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. What we see here and what we just heard there was a really awesome storyline as what discipline looks like from God to his children. Like, God is laying out a storyline, and he's saying, hey, here's the deal. This is the way that I laid it out for these guys to live, and not only just laid it out for them to live, but if they stayed in accordance and lived in the path, in the way that I laid out for them to live, man, I was going to bless them like crazy. And so the last point that I would make here, and that is that there are benefits to living out the God plan in our lives. It's not that we just live this out and there's nothing to it. There are benefits to it. You know, the text in, in Deuteronomy does not just tell us what God desires from his children, but it also tells us the blessings that are in store for his children when they follow the plan that God has for them. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 11, let's, con let's continue. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters, welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, and a land of olive trees and honey, 
a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, from uh, whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Now what happened, we got to keep in mind, by the time the Old Testament came around, these commandments, these ordinances, these statutes, they became things that um, the scribes and Pharisees sort of like, you know, put as uh, things that they would worship. And so it was a very destructive thing, you know, for this thing that God originally said, hey, here are the walls, here are the gates that I'm going to put in place, stay within them, don't move out of them. And what ended up happening was, you know, children of God ended up taking these laws, these laws, these statutes that God had put in place, and now they became things that they worshipped, which of course meant that there were those who counted and there were those who didn't, and that was not what God had put them in place for. That was not the goal of these laws. The goal of these laws was all to keep God and his children in a right kind of relationship. Hey, he, here's the deal. I love you. I want you to love me in return. Okay, God, how do we do that? Just live like this. Do life like this. Hey, here's the deal. Nothing has changed. God still has a desire for us to do life like this, in this way. Only difference is that we don't follow it because of the law. We follow it because of our crazy love for God. God, I am so in love with you, therefore I'm going to fall into the plan that you have in store for my life. That's why we do it. I don't need you to show up at church. I, I think it's great that you come on Sundays, but that's, that's not what it's about. You do it because, man, you're so in love with God. And you want him so bad. So the blessings of, a, of the God plan. Let's go through some of them here. I only focus on a limited amount of things. The God things. Now, interestingly, you're wondering what, that, what, that, what that's supposed to look like, right? But here's the deal. It also means that I don't get distracted with things that are not the God things. In other words, if that thing ain't on my plate, it don't need to be on my plate. And obviously that's something that we're continuously assessing and asking ourselves, is this something that is even mine, that I even need to be dealing with? So the blessings of the God plan, hey, I only get to focus on me and what God wants me to see. Other point is, I don't get distracted with other stuff. I only got so many t hours in a day, so much time in a day, and I need to really be, again, every step that I take, I need, make, need to make sure that every step that I take is the God step, not my own. So it's very selfless living. Here's another one. I feel healthy, happy, and holy. Woo! I love the material. And I was telling Bob this week, I said, man, Bob, I just love this material from the 40-day fast. I said, man, when I read that material in the morning time and get my day going, I said, man, I feel so so close to God. You know, we start off with this prayer that says from James, it says, as I draw nearer to you, God, you're going to draw nearer to me. I had to open my Bible and look that scripture up, but it does say it. That as I draw nearer to you, God, God is going to draw nearer to me. God, I need you to draw nearer to me on a daily basis. I feel healthy, happy, and holy. I need to feel that way. Here's another blessing. I have godly success in my life. Man, I have godly success in my life. Now you're asking, well, Dorian, what is godly success? Well, here's the evidence of godly success in my life. I am Holy Spirit connected. Oh, what is Holy Spirit connected? It means I'm hearing from the Holy Spirit, daggone it. The Holy Spirit is in me. If the Holy Spirit is in me, daggone it, I ought to be hearing from the Holy Spirit. On a daily basis, not like, oh, once a year the Holy Spirit speaks to me. No, I am going to get everything that I can get from the Holy Spirit. I drove to work this morning and uh, sat in my car, and I felt the Holy Spirit saying, Dorian, it's 835, I want you to sit in the car until 840 and just see if there's anything that I have to say to you. And I just sat there and I was like, all right, God. And the Holy Spirit just spoke. 
while sitting there, he brought up names of people to me. You know, brought situations that might happen today. I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, I'll be aware of that. But I just, the most important thing was that I understood and I stopped. No, I did not pray. No, I did not talk. I said, Holy Spirit, speak to me. If we've got the Holy Spirit in us, we need to start taking advantage of hearing from the Holy Spirit. We need to be connected to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's me just in a calm, casual, chilled place. But what about when the crap hits the fan on a weekly basis and things are moving and our emotions are all over the place and the devil is tugging and tempting our flesh to do and to say? Do we ever stop? Pray? God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to act? What do you want me to say? Here's another evidence of godly success. My kids are spiritually well. Just this week, I was listening to the message by Craig Rochelle, and it just reminded me of how important I need to make sure my kids are connected to God and, and how much I need to make sure that I'm not just being casual and I'm not just being chilled. I'm not just trying to be the cool dad, but I'm intentionally leaning into having God conversations with my kids that I'm encouraging them to serve and to volunteer in the church and for them to develop a relationship with God so that when they grow up to become adults, they themselves have their own relationship with God and are rocking it. Kids are spiritually connected. They're reading the word. They're praying to God. It was so funny, me and Janice had a situation the other day. I was so proud of Janice. Dyson felt like he wanted a certain toy for Christmas and we didn't want to buy it because he's an expensive kid. And... Janice, just out of the blue, said, well, Dyson, why don't you do this? Why don't you pray about that and then come back tomorrow morning and tell us what you feel God is saying? I thought, I was like, whoa, you go, girl. That was so awesome. She just brought the God piece right in and like, hey, man, go pray about that. And he went and prayed about it. He came back the next day. Well, Dad, I prayed about it. And Dad, I feel God is telling me I should get that present. And, and, you, and you know what we said? We said, okay, if you feel that that's what God is telling you, then, we, hey, we're rolling with you, man, you know? Now, here's what's interesting. Dyson still ain't got the present. No, not because we didn't want to buy it. We basically gave him the money, and we said, well, hey, here's the money. Go buy your present. Dyson still ain't gone out and bought the present yet. He's, he's, he's going to figure that God thing out. At some point, maybe he'll process that later on down the road, you know. My kids are spiritually well. Hey, here's another one. I am financially sound. Oh, yeah, baby. Dave Ramsey would love that point. I'm financially sound. Just not just living loosey-goosey and just going off of everything that I want. But, man, I am setting myself up to make sure that I'm going to do well for generations to come. Man, I, I, my mom and dad worked so hard for me and my siblings to go to college and get an education. My dad grew up, didn't finish, didn't even go to, to middle school. I think he just finished like sixth grade. You know, he lived on the islands. They didn't really have much. He grew up and just uh, picked up the trade that, you know, he learned just from, from as a kid growing up, you know, you know working in a field and, and, and helping to build, work construction, fishing. And dad grew up and he, he was a builder and he, that's how he, he made his money. And, and I still wonder how dad those did it. But they sent us all, all off to college, and, and, and our lives are a whole lot better because of the lives that they lived and the decisions that they made in their lives. And my mom and dad, give so, they gave so much over the years. They didn't just live wise financially just for them, but they lived wise financially for us and for our grandkids and, and for their grandkids, you know? How are we making sure that we're living wise financially and storing up for generations to come down the road. Here's another one. I have joy in the midst of struggle. Joy in the midst of struggle. Here's another one. I am happy with what I have. I, am a, I have a settled heart, you know. Here's another one. I feel healthy even though in sickness. Boy, that's a hard one. I feel healthy even in sickness because I know God's got me. Don't forget, I know my true north. I know who I believe in. 
And then here's the last one. I am looking forward to see Jesus. Woo. Man, COVID, come on. But I'm looking forward to see Jesus. Come on, who, whoever wants to attack, hurt, try to destroy me. Man, I am looking forward to see Jesus. Yeah, I know there's struggle and tension with all of those kinds of things. But at some point, I've got to land in a place of, yeah, but I'm looking forward to see Jesus. And I hope you are too. So again, I'm going to close with these scriptures here. Colossians 3, 12 and 15. Since God chose you to be holy people, he loves you. You must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive one another. Every, and, or forgive anyone who offends you. Forgive one another. Remember the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Not anger, not division, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. And always be thankful. We're called to live in peace. We we're called to live in peace. The, the consistent message that has been going out across social media airstreams and uh, fr in, from pastors and Christian leaders has been this message of we are called to live in peace. But all of the tension that's happening in Washington, all the tension that's happening around the world, here's the one message. Children of God, those who follow Christ, those who consider Jesus Christ to be your leader, your true north, we are called to live in peace. And that's a tough one, right? Because there are going to be some things that goes across that I don't agree with, that I don't like. Wrestle with that. We're called to live in peace. See, it's hard to not live in peace and live out everything that I just said. How, how are you going to do that? That's two different kinds of people. So for consistency to take place, you've got to lean down the path of we are called to live in peace. Now, I'm going to call some of y'all out. If you're on Facebook and you're doing a bunch of messy foolishness and saying a bunch of messy stuff that's not living in peace, you need to understand when you roll up at church and someone who doesn't agree with you or someone who has been offended by you sees you or looks at you or walks past you, don't you think that they're going to be offended or even possibly hurt? We're called to live in peace. I want to challenge you in this, in, this, in this year and in this season to live like a God child, to let God ooze out of you. Yes, I know, I mean in those times, even when things are tough and hard. Let the presence of God ooze out of you. Let people look at you and say to you, man, how do you do it? There's got to be something that you have been bothered by and that you don't agree with. Like, how do you live with joy? All this joy, you're always smiling, you're always hugging folk. I know you don't agree with everyone you hug, and I know you definitely don't love them. But you, you embrace everyone, and you love everyone, and you're peaceful. To every how do you do it? Let the peace of God comes from Christ, roam within your heart. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Worship team is going to sing this last song. I want to, I want to encourage you to check yourself. Just, let, just like I did this morning, it took five minutes to chill. I want you to take a moment and just let the Holy Spirit speak. Ask him to. Holy Spirit, just speak. Talk to me. Tell me about my stuff. If there's something I need to see, Lord, I need to see it. Let me know you're the one. He'll show it to you. Join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, just come and just have your way. Speak, God. Your children hear it. We want to open our ears and our minds to be able to be receptive to your voice. Speak, God. Minister to us. Show us your will for our lives. Lord, we're listening. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way.
Thanks, Emily. That was awesome. So here's the deal. This week, I just believe that God is not just moving today. I believe he's going to move even after we leave out of this building. He'll continue to guide and protect you. Keep having conversations like this, man, with your mate, with your family, with your kids. Just, just ask for God just to, just to fill your home, to fill your life, and to guide you specifically in this season of this year. This is the time where you have the ability to change the rhythm and let that rhythm ride out for the rest of the year. So that's our prayer. God, have full control. We're your kids, and we want you to lead us. We want you to guide us. We want to be more like you. 
We want to lean into your presence. Hey, don't forget we have our Monday night prayer tomorrow night. Wonderful time to just lean into the presence of God. Don't forget to sign up for Starting Point and uh, get, you know, entrenched in that whole deal. And you got family and friends, get them signed up also. Hey, have a wonderful week, and I will see you next week. God bless you. Take care.